In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty, ever-living God, who by singular grace gave the priest, St. Pius, a share of the cross of your Son, and by means of his ministry, renewed the wonders of your mercy, grant that through his intercession we may be united constantly to the sufferings of Christ, and so brought happily to the glory of the resurrection. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. St. Padre Pio, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. So, um, you know, I gave this class yesterday in Highlands, and it takes longer than anticipated because uh, there's a lot of stuff, even on the fourth commandment, believe it, believe it or not. So um, let's just jump right on in. So we're transitioning uh, from the first three commandments that deal directly with God to how it is that we deal uh, with each other. And so if you have the book, uh, it's, well, where we left off, um, page 134. If you're following electronically, number 455. All right. So we, we all know what the fourth commandment is to honor your father and your mother. Right off the bat, you'll notice that is a that it's not a thou shalt not, is it? You know, a lot of the others are thou shalt not do X, Y, or Z, but this is a positive command, um, which is interesting. And I think it also in the original text says uh, that you may prosper. Um, let's see if we can pull that up. Honor your father and your mother, and that your days may be long in the land which your Lord will give you. Okay, so. There's uh, a reward attached to that, as opposed to the others, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, etc. All right, so what do, we, what, do, what, do, what do we mean by this? It commands us to honor and respect our parents and those whom God, for our good, has vested with authority. All right, so right off the bat, we're not just talking about our biological parents, but we're talking about anybody who rightly has authority over us. Okay, and we'll kind of unpack that. So whether it's a step parent or a foster parent uh, or uh, probably to a babysitter, you know, if you're put in, if a babysitter's put in charge of you for a few hours, um, you know, as a kid, you need to obey the babysitter. Um, we'll talk about what the limits are in terms of obedience, but by further extension, uh, government. Okay, we'll talk about our duties towards government. Uh, and that's where things get off the rails pretty quick. <laughs> All right. Uh, what is the nature of family in the plan of God? Okay. So this is the first time we're hearing about family in the context of the commandments. A man and a woman united in marriage form a family together with their children. All right. That may be labeled as hate speech today, but it is what we believe, and we're not going to stop believing it. Um, it is what it is. God instituted the family and endowed it with its fundamental constitution. All right, so this, note that, that is antecedent to what society recognizes. You know, the world just didn't come to be. God created the world, God created human nature, and God created the family, the human family. Now, it's great, you know, we, we have to admit, sometimes things go awry. You know, maybe a parent uh, or a young spouse passes away, okay? And there's a single parent uh, situation. Um, can God work with that? Yeah. But is that the ideal? Ideal? Obviously not. Um, and some couples are sterile. Um, and so, you know, maybe they uh, adopt a child, and, uh, and that's fantastic. But um, at any rate, uh, but what, that's what God has created. And so government doesn't have a right to, um, to violate uh, our human nature and, by extension, what the family is. Um, but we'll talk about that. Marriage and the family are ordered to the good of the spouses and to the procreation and education of children. We will talk a lot more about that when we get to the sixth and the ninth commandment, which will probably be next week, okay? So all the uh, sins dealing with um, the flesh. So I, I will wait to unpack that particular line until we get there. Members of the same family establish among themselves personal relationships and primary responsibilities. Okay, 
So what you owe your parents is something more proximate and fundamental um, or your immediate family members than say the person down the street or um, whatever, the government even. Uh, in Christ, the family becomes the domestic church because it is a community of faith and of hope and of charity, okay? Um, look, at, look at salvation history. Um, begins with a couple, okay? And the only, the first time, actually, the, um, you know, during the creation, it says uh, God created X, Y, or Z, and it was good. He created it good. The first time um, it says it's not good is when God says it is not good for man to live alone. And that sort of opens the door into um, the creation of Eve. And so that's the proper context for human beings not to be isolated, uh, but to form, uh, forge families. So that's the very beginning of salvation. What's at the very end of salvation? The wedding feast of the Lamb. So yet, yeah, family yet yeah, again, okay? And so uh, we are invited into the family of God, into the most holy trinity. Um, you know, the church is the bride of Christ. Okay, so it's very, very familial. And so our own little domestic churches, our, our families, that's um, obviously very important, and it's going to unpack why. What place does the family occupy in society? It's the original cell of human society. It is therefore prior to any recognition by public authority. It's written into our nature. Therefore, I don't care if we have a majority vote, you can't undo it. Um, yeah, you know, that's something that's been tried for you know many many centuries and millennia. I mean, even Plato. Uh, living in his own mind, you know, just imagine the doing away of the family and having the state raise the children and in the Republic. If you ever read the Republic, um, obviously it doesn't reflect nature at all. That's why I, why I tend towards Aristotle myself. But um, communism, they tried it, they tried it, they tried it to dismantle the family. They are the ones who introduced, uh, you know, things like divorce and, and abortion. And, but they realize that they can't completely dissolve the family. You know, it would be a complete breakdown. But nonetheless, there were many attempts. That's one of the errors of Russia, the attack on the family, which is an attack on human nature, which is an attack of God, because we're creating the image and likeness of God. So that you always got to bring in the supernatural elements of these things, too. This is a spiritual battle, and the devil hates um, uh, God, ultimately, and uh, he, therefore he's going to attack the, the, the image of God. Don't you see that happening right now in this country? I could go on my soapbox right now, okay. uh, or I could just stick with the fundamentals here. Um, obviously, we're going to get close to things that impact our lives personally, and um, it is my job to, to try to stick to the fundamentals here um, and try not to give you my opinion, but to do my best to try to give you... Uh, what I believe the church teaches us with authority, okay? Um, so, at any rate, I'm going to try to show a little bit more self-restraint than yesterday. We'll put it that way. <laughs> All right. Um, but uh, family values and principles constitute the foundation of social life. Family life is an initiation into the life of society. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, that obviously is true. That's how you learn how to deal with other people. You begin within your family. You don't steal your sibling's toy. You know, you don't do other really dumb things. Um, and your parents are teaching you how to, they're teaching, so they're, they're socializing you. Um, but what are the duties of, that society has towards the family? Society, while respecting the principle of subsidiarity, you remember that subsidiarity is the idea of the not having distant centralized uh, governance and authority, but rather opting towards the most local um, authority, okay? Uh, such that people are actually faces, they're not numbers on a spreadsheet in Washington or whatever. And so at any rate, all right, so society while respecting the principle of subsidiarity has the duty to support and strengthen um, marriage and the family. Uh, public authority must respect, protect, respect, protect, and foster the true nature of marriage, 
and the family, public morality, the rights of parents, and domestic prosperity, okay? Um, we live in a pluralistic society, okay? This is not a Catholic state, uh, even though Christ has a right to rule over the United States, as teaches uh, Pope Pius XI and basically all of his predecessors in Quas Primus, the institution of Christ, the Feast of Christ the King, our Lord has a right to rule over all societies, over all individuals, all families, all societies, including these United States. He has an, he has an absolute right to rule over it, okay? Because he is the creator and he's the redeemer, the creator of every human being, and he, he offers redemption and desires salvation for every human being. Okay, so... Um, he has a right to rule over uh, our society, and um, what was my point? The, uh, to support and strengthen uh, what is it? The, the true nature of marriage and the family. All right. So if we live in a pluralistic society, and we just we come to different conclusions on things, especially religious things, uh, how do you have a pro how do you have a peaceful society? How do you order society? Uh, when you have people who have different values living therein, okay? We can't, can't force no meat on Fridays, you know, uh, on the populace. One thing that we do have, though, that we share in common, even if we have different opinions and values, uh, we share the same human nature. That's the foundation of our equality. Everybody wants equality. Well, it's rooted in something that is shared by everybody, a common human nature. And reason a nature that is endowed with reason. Um, and so human nature can be understood by means of reason. The family can be understood by means of reason. And so I would argue that if you're going to live in a pluralistic society, the one governing principle that you could rely on is that of reason and of an acknowledgement of shared common human nature. So why am I bringing that up? If a percentage of our society has chosen to redefine human nature, well, they think they can, or to redefine marriage, or to redefine families, things of that nature. Um, point is, they don't have a right to do that. Just because you get 51% of the vote of something, or just because some judge rules something, it doesn't make it right. And, um, and so the true nature of marriage and family is embedded in, it, it's unchangeable. Put it that way. It is unchangeable. They're like trying to, to square a circle legally by redefining marriage and the family. Okay. Um, so at any rate, uh, society has a responsibility and a duty to acknowledge the true nature of family, uh, marriage and family, and to protect it. Okay. So we as Catholics will talk about our duties in society. Um, we have a duty uh, to be active in our society and to make sure that we are advocating for the defense of marriage and the family. And not just saying, oh, well, I guess it's just going down the tubes. All right. So um, what are the duties of children towards parents? All right. So this is what we more commonly think of when talking about the fourth commandment. Children owe respect. That is filial piety, gratitude, docility, meaning a willingness to be taught and obedience to their parents. Think of our blessed Lord, who was a child, and I'm pretty sure it was the uh, Gospel of Luke. Um, yeah, because finding in the temple, um, the Lord at 12 years old, very last line before it goes into his adulthood, and he returned to Nazareth and submitted himself unto them. He was obedient to Mary and Joseph. So even Christ our Lord, God in the flesh, um, experienced and fulfilled the fourth commandment, and he was obedient to his parents. And I'm sure with everything else, gratitude, docility, filial piety. In paying them uh, respect and in, re and in fostering good relationships with their brothers and sisters, uh, children contribute to the growth and the harmony and holiness and family life in general. Yeah, that's a nice idea. Okay. Uh, adult children, okay, should give their parents material and moral support whenever they find themselves in situations of distress, sickness, loneliness, or of old age. All right, so uh, some distinctions here. Um, 
uh, which is brought by the age of emancipation, I believe it's called legally, uh, such that when your child is uh, a minor and still li living in your home, the effect of the fourth commandment is going to be different than when your child is grown and married and they have a family of their own. But it doesn't mean that the fourth commandment goes away. It's just how do you understand it? And I mean, this is where um, uh, I think you'll, you'll even see some different applications of this, of this uh, commandment insofar as in our culture, what's the age of emancipation? generally considered 18. Um, I don't know, legally, can you leave the house uh, prior to, to 18? I know you can marry prior to 18. You can emancipate before you're 18. Okay, but you have to go through a process? Yeah, a legal process. Okay, so, um, all right, so, but that concept does exist in our society. So if, if you go through that process of emancipation, um, then so be it. Uh, but if not, then I guess it's considered until you're 18. Um, but what if you're still in high school and you're an 18 year old? I don't know, that's kind of different, isn't it? Um, I guess you can just up and leave, right? As soon as you turn 18 without any sort of legal anything. Okay, so let's say you're 18, but you're still living at home. Okay, what do you owe then? Well, you, obviously you owe something. Um, let's say you get up and leave the day you turn 18, it's the middle of your senior year of high school. You get an apartment for yourself. Um, can, can your parents tell you what time to go to bed? You know, if you're no longer living in their house? Probably not, um, but uh, but you still owe them respect. I don't know. So, whereas other cultures, uh, it may be even younger, okay? Uh, some cultures, uh, uh, females marry at 14, okay? And uh, so, at any rate, uh, the, so the age of emancipation. Um, so, yeah, I mean, children still owe respect to their parents, you know, once they're of, once they're, you know, of age. And was it, um, it was Mother Teresa who identified true poverty as not being in Calcutta. She identified true poverty as being in America because it was a spiritual poverty because of the reliance on, on riches. And she talked about visiting uh, nursing homes uh, where parents had been, depo uh, aging parents had been basically deposited and, and left. Okay, and just the, the blank stares um, that she uh, encountered there and identifying that as a real type of, po of poverty. All right, so look, the church isn't going to tell you um, you can't send your uh, parent into a nursing home or how many times you have to visit or whatever. Um, it's, it's the principles there to, to honor, respect, and support your parents in in the different situations and conditions of life, okay? So if visiting once a week in a nursing home is appropriate, then that's appropriate. But if you don't visit, you know, at all in a decade, probably not appropriate, okay? Um, and if they need, you know, what, what do they need? You know, what if they're having a hard time paying their bills and you do have uh, enough money to, to assist them? I mean, there is that burden. So I, we can go through example of example, but... At any rate, um, fourth commandment doesn't go away once you reach the age of emancipation, we'll put it that way. All right, uh, the duties of parents towards children. Parents in virtue of their participation in the fatherhood of God. Remember that. That's, um, you are being allowed to bring life and to participate in the bringing of life into this world. Um, so it's not an absolute thing, but you get to participate. It's a participatory thing. Uh, so parents have the first responsibility for the education of their children, uh, and they are the first heralds of the faith for them. All right, so what do we mean by education? Um, I mean, obviously a basic education, but that may change from culture to culture, right? I mean, if this was 18th century France, um, you know, to would you be obliged to get your kid through through high school or to try to do that i mean hardly anybody you know had that type of education um i don't maybe i'm misspeaking on that but point is culture does change and being able to the idea of, i guess education is to be able to uh, set up your child for for to be successful and, and that's going to be colored slightly differently from culture to culture and from you know century to century i guess but the more so the spiritual education 
That is probably the same across the board. Um, the fact that we need to educate our children in regards to the faith. Um, and I mean, just look, the whole thing collapsed in the 60s, okay? It just simply collapsed. Catechesis in particular that I'm thinking of, okay? And, um, and I think people, their heads were really spinning. And so I, what I'm, why, why am I speaking like this? Because I, a lot of parents who are now older, um, I think, put a type of guilt on themselves because maybe their children don't practice the faith anymore. And I guess I just want, before going into this, I, I want, it to, want us to keep it in perspective. First of all, it's an incredibly difficult time to have any sort of faith um, in the 20th century, now 21st century, in a, a time and place of prosperity. You know, the Lord's not wasting his time constantly warning us about wealth, okay? As soon as Ireland entered the EU, guess what? Faith went out the window. <coughs> And I think we, in this diocese alone, have more seminaries in the entire country of Ireland. Ireland, which used to supply the entire world with priests. All right? Let's stop saying that this is a, a springtime and everything is well in the church. It is not. Um, so, uh, it's, it's just a, that's, that's headwind. You know, kids, uh, you know, with, with everything, with, with television, with video games, with the world at their fingertips on phones, with a pluralistic society, with uh, pleasures of all sorts, with pornography, uh, with drugs, uh, with the college experience, which lends itself to depravity. Um, like, we just gotta keep these things in perspective. And catechesis collapsed. Everybody got the sense that after Vatican II, everything changed. Well, it didn't. The faith doesn't change because Christ doesn't change. But everybody had that impression. And so throwing out the Baltimore catechisms um, and, and, and the countless women religious leaving religious life. I mean, to the, and, 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 and tens of thousands of priests leaving the priesthood. Okay? It was a chaotic time. And so I'm saying all this to try to assuage any sense of guilt if any, if any of you have that in terms of your children. This was a difficult time, okay? So, but nonetheless, the, uh, uh, it, it's our duty um, to, ch to raise our children in the practice of the faith um, and to get them truly to, to, to hold on to it, okay? Um, they have a duty, parents have a duty to love and respect their children as persons and as children of God and to provide as far as possible for their physical and spiritual needs. I do wish I would see uh, younger couples having a greater emphasis on the spiritual needs of children. There's so much emphasis on athletics and getting them to good colleges. Well, guess what? Your trophies in your room and your Harvard degree is not gonna get you into heaven. Uh, sometimes it may work against you insofar as it could be a distraction. Um, the one thing that matters is Christ. So um, at any rate, um, so that means you're making sure they're going to mass, going to confession regularly, uh, learning their faith, um, etc. Now, kids have free will, just like we do, and they can choose to reject the faith, um, whether for just a time and they come back later, or until they go to meet their creator. Um, and so that's the other thing to keep in mind. People have free will, and some will simply choose to another path other than, than our Lord. Now, they should select for them a suitable school to help them uh, with prudent counsel and the choice of their profession and their state in life. Prudent counsel, that's not pressure, okay? Parents that pressure children uh, one way or the other, that, that could be problematic. Um, but what if the child is truly going, uh, you know, a child will say they want to be a, become a pornographer. Okay, uh, we should probably go a little bit more than, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> probably be like don't even think about it kid yeah. in particular they have the, the mission in educating their children in the Christian faith alright uh, now how our parents educate their children in the faith example prayer family prayer uh, family that prays together stays together 
uh, family catechesis, and participation in the life of the church. Okay. Uh, are family bonds an absolute good? They are not an absolute good because the first vocation of a Christian is to follow Jesus, to love him. Remember he said, he who loves father or, lo or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. All right, so obviously the Lord doesn't want discord in families. But I think the point is, to the degree that your family is pulling you away from Christ, um, you can't choose your family over Christ. Okay? And, um, I mean, you know, let's just take a step back for a second and... Uh, if our Lord wasn't really God in the flesh, but he was just some, some dude teaching us to love one another, you know, how the world sees him, you know, right? The majority of the world sees him. How would you, I mean, how could he still be a good guy and say something like this? Let's say the, you know, the, the you know, founder of a religion who's really just a dude, okay, knows he's not God in the flesh. If he's out there saying, you've got to choose me over your very, very families, that would sound like an egotistical maniac, people, okay, who probably has some Kool-Aid for you when Haley's Comet is going to be coming by next, okay? Uh, so, at any rate, but if our Lord is God in the flesh, then this is entirely appropriate, and it makes sense, okay? I'm just really sick and tired of, well, Jesus is just a nice, you know, leader. There, there are other faiths, too. No, they're not. He says, I am the one way to the Father. Okay. All right. Uh, parents must support with joy their, their children's choice to follow Jesus in whatever state of life, uh, including consecrated life or priestly ministry. All right. So there's got to be a healthy balance um, uh, in parents dealing with children as they're coming of age and discerning their vocations in life. On one hand, you can't be pressuring your child into priesthood of religious life. On the other hand, you really ought not be dissuading them from it. You know, you only participated in bringing your child into this world. You gave them their DNA, okay? But Christ gave them their soul and their ultimate purpose. And so there's got to be a healthy balance of an openness and of support for whatever Christ wants them to do and to help them to understand what Christ wants them to do to do okay anything on the family we're about to transition over into government okay. all right um how should authority be exercised in various uh spheres of civil society you know, i'm sorry you know to go back one you know what parents also also should learn to love all their children the same in a family, if you see one, then that really hurts the other children. I mean, mm -hmm. but that's part of the family deal. Jesus wants us to love them all the same, all differently and all the same. Mm -hmm. and no so one, not to have favorites, in other words. No, no, my parents didn't. Mm -hmm. I haven't, no, mm -hmm. no favorites. How does that, how does that okay, so as we're transitioning over into civil society, uh, just a reminder of what we were talking about uh, a few weeks ago, the nature of law different types of law, how they adjust law needs to be in sync with the other laws, etc. All right, you'll recall that a law is an ordinance of reason, okay? So it's got to be founded in reason. So when God creates literally everything, every molecule, every atom, every cork, whatever, everything in the world, he creates it for a certain purpose, namely for himself. And that governance, bringing all creation to its ultimate fulfillment and its purpose, is what's called eternal law. So it's the highest law. It's just the governance of everything to the proper end. Um, then we have natural law, okay? Um, you see the way that uh, water, hmm. I wonder if this is limited to animated life. Um, well, we'll just stick with that example. I mean, we talked about, I think, beavers. How the heck a beaver can look at a stick and look at a river and know what to do, okay? Something is driving them, 
okay? And that's, uh, that's, natural, that's natural law, okay? Um, we have divinely revealed law. For instance, the Ten Commandments that we are walking through right now, okay? Uh, notice how it's in complete conformity with these other laws, even though they're, they are distinct, but they are in complete harmony, okay? So divinely revealed law, and then we got, can we get into what's called, um, well, I wonder if, for instance, the precepts of the church, let's, let's put that aside for a second, positive law. So, you know, governing body puts forward law. So you can have ecclesiastical positive law, like, um, uh, no meat on Fridays, okay? Um, we'll just say no meat on Fridays during Lent, okay? Another issue. Um, yeah. Positive law, but also civil law. All right? Now, for it to be a legitimate law, it better be in conformity with all the other laws, okay? The United States or England or India, they don't get to just detach from the rest of creation and just do its own thing okay um, so we talked about this slightly before maybe I'll just very briefly mention in terms of because it's probably gonna be helpful actually the understanding of law today um, the different views of how we understand law um, remember intellect and will these are our two highest faculties. Um, our argument is that since law is an ordinance of reason, that God is directing everything to its end, and that is in accordance with God's wisdom, that our understanding of law is that it has to be reasonable. It, but it's also free, so both get a check mark. But that the, the laws are reasonable. If they reflect reason, if they reflect nature, if they reflect the eternal law, um, then that's how we understand law. I would say the majority of the world today is what's, uh, what's called uh, volu voluntarists. Or they believe in what's called voluntarism, which is basically it's what the world believes in today. The will. Whatever you want. So 51% of your legislative body votes for something because they wanted it, no. it's okay. Okay. Um, the way that Muslims understand God, they see God as whatever God wants, it's good because he wanted it. And so if he tells us to worship an idol, it's good. If he tells us to blow up a building, it's good. Okay? Um, but that's their misunderstanding of the nature of God. Whereas we would argue that God would never contradict his, 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 his power, would never contradict his wisdom. His will would never contradict his intellect. He never even tried to square a circle or to lift a, a rock too heavy for him to lift or whatever ridiculous thing, okay? So uh, this, I think, and I think even Catholics struggle with this, okay? That uh, basically might makes right because you want something, it's okay, okay? And so they, they say, they look at the Vatican right now like, well, the Vatican can change anything in the, in the faith. No, it can't. And what's difficult is all the mixed signals the Vatican is sending right now. It seems to suggest it's trying to change the faith, but it can't change the faith. But a lot of people are completely fine with uh, the church changing its own faith, its own tradition, its own, the deposit of faith that Christ gave to the church. But it can't, because might doesn't make right. You have to keep reason into the equation. Okay? So, that as a background... Let's talk about the uh, civil authorities. Authority should always uh, be exercised as a service, respecting fundamental human rights, a just hierarchy of values, laws, distributive justice, and the principle of subsidiarity. Oh, well, that's a mouthful, ain't it? Okay. So uh, fundamental human rights. So certain things like each human being is created in God's image and likeness. And just because the third right comes to power, uh, or uh, Russia turns Soviet red, uh, doesn't mean you can start violating those fundamental human life, 
uh, rights, such as not to be killed by a government, okay? Um, because you're not, whatever, you know, acquiescing to their, uh, to their agenda. Um, uh, hierarchy of values, um, what comes to my mind, I, I mean, I suppose I could do some more study on this, is the, um, in the Declaration of Independence, that we have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But I think the ranking of those are very important as well, okay? So in the slavery debate, the right for a slave owner, or business owner for that matter, to pursue happiness, um, that's his true right. But uh, there, it gets trumped by a more fundamental right, okay? That is the liberty of the human being. Um, and on the abortion debate, the uh, quote-unquote liberty of a mother to do what, by the way? Uh, let's not use any euphemisms. To kill a growing baby inside of her, okay? So her right to, uh, to self-autonomy, if we want to use a euphemism, gets trumped by a more fundamental right of the life of the child. Life is more important than liberty. Liberty is more important than the pursuit of happiness, okay? So we have to have a just or appropriate hierarchy of values, society must recognize that, okay? Um, uh, yeah. So just because seven justices in 1973 said that women have a quote-unquote right to terminate their pregnancies, it doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it correct. Uh, that was an evil, uh, unjust ruling uh, by seven judges that have since gone to their eternal reward. And I'm sure we're asked about that vote on that case by Christ our Lord, the author of all life. Um, okay? So just because some judges say something is okay doesn't make it okay. Just because our legislators make a, a law redefining marriage or whatever, it doesn't, it doesn't make it okay. Like when Dred Scott decision of, um, or any other unjust decisions, like, can you really make a black person three-fifths of a person? Can, can, if, if a body, a legislative body says that, is that really the case? No, it's a dumb, unjust law. Okay, uh, so, you know, talked about, okay, distributive justice. That basically is, is the justice of a government, what a government owes to its individuals, okay? We owe something to the government, the government owes something to us. Uh, the government owes us, for instance, to keep peace and tranquility in the, re in the, in the realm, for instance. Okay? Uh, we are owed that by our government. We talk about subsidiarity. All those who exercise authority should seek the interests of the community before their own uh, interests and allow their decisions to be inspired by the truth about God, by, uh, about man, and about the world. Okay? It is very edifying to hear of when you do get a good uh, government official in there who acts in accord with his faith. You know, I, I heard recently of a senator who was enrolled in the Brown Scapular not too long ago. That was very encouraging to hear. Okay, now what are the duties of citizens in regards to civil authorities? This will be fun. <laughs> Those subject to authority should regard those in authority as representatives of God oh my. and offer their loyal collaboration for the right functioning of public and social life. All right. What do we mean by that? Have the image of Christ before Pontius Pilate. Okay. What did our Lord, who created the world, uh, say to Pontius Pilate? Uh, Pilate tells our Lord, I have the right to crucify you or set you free. And our Lord says to him, you would have no authority unless it had been given to you from above. So Christ our Lord recognized the authority that Pontius Pilate possessed, even as Pilate was going to allow an innocent man, and Pilate believed him to be innocent, our Lord, not, so just because Pilate is erring in his duties, like you don't put an innocent man to death, for instance, uh, doesn't mean he doesn't have authority, okay? And the, the early centuries of Christianity, well, all right, on another occasion, our Lord says, 
uh, to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and to render unto God what is God's, okay? Um, throughout the New Testament, I think both Peter and Paul, definitely Peter, or excuse me, definitely Paul, they say that we need to uh, pray for the emperor, okay? Um, and uh, the point isn't to be leading revolutions. That's not the point of Christianity, okay? So uh, just because uh, somebody has legitimate authority, uh, and just because we recognize their legitimate authority, doesn't mean we're agreeing with them, okay? I mean, name for me a single government today that doesn't do at least some things wrong. I mean, all of them are going to do something wrong. So um, at any rate, uh, our business is not to create a utopia in this world. You see, that's what the communists are trying to do. And their ugly little sister, socialists. Um, they're trying to create uh, a utopia in this world. Of course, they do nothing but kill people, like 100 million people in the 20th century alone. But um, our goal is not this world. So when the heretical, a, a, a percentage of the Jesuits were were also heretical um, and operating in South America in, for instance, the 80s, they were leading armed revolutions, you know, uh, and in, in favor of communist regimes led by an idea called liberation theology, which is basically a bastardization of the gospel to uh, communism, okay? So Christ, uh, leading us out of sin, they reinterpret as uh, Christ leading us out of social injustice and that we need to establish new governments and all that. Well, John Paul II didn't have any time for that. Um, and he publicly like was yelling at one of these guys and pointing at him. Did you ever see that? You can see it online. John Paul II, he riding whatever South American country and this famous uh, liberation theologian comes up to- Talking too softly again. Um, so uh, John Paul II was yelling uh, at this liberation theologian. Okay. Um, That's his coffee's wearing off. What else? All right. So, um, all right. So, what do we mean by loyal collaboration for the right functioning of public and social life? This collaboration includes love and service of one's homeland, the right and duty to vote, payment of taxes, the defense of one's country, and the right to exercise constructive criticism. All right, so it's definitely in Christian DNA to, by default, be patriots, okay? Um, I mean, you can get into conversations about when is it legitimate to overthrow a government, I don't know, but that's not the purpose of today. The purpose of today is simply to say, by default, we are to be, um, you know, patriots and to serve our country. I would also add that um, I, I think, I think globalism uh, is inimical to our faith uh, insofar as you have unnamed um, forces, um, mostly corporate, uh, controlling people and not their own representative government, um, which it lends itself very well to the errors of Russia. Communism in its DNA desires global revolution. From the very beginning, that is what it seeks after. And so to undermine the nation state uh, is a problem, okay? So, anyway, but we don't need to go too far afield on, on globalism. Yeah. Uh, does the idea that uh, God gives great authority to people like Pontius Pilate, all the rulers of the world, doesn't it also um, jive still with like the devil's uh, lie or, or his um, statement that he, looked, that he has give, been given power over the world when he tempts Jesus in the desert, and then Paul talking about our battles not against flesh and blood, so... Yeah. Even though like, we could say like, an authority figure has authority from God, isn't it also sort of like saying that the devil has authority or power, which is, doesn't make him good? Yeah. 
How, how, how do we think about that? Well, what you're mentioning of the temptation of the desert is perfect because that was the final temptation. I will give to you all these kingdoms because he, he has, he has, he's ruling over them to some degree or another. Yeah, uh, but just because uh, he has been permitted to exercise his authority even over governments, um, and you can talk to exorcists who, who say that uh, a country can have a guardian angel, but a country can also have a, uh, an assigned demon. Um, so in Fatima, for instance, you had the guardian angel of Portugal uh, was involved at one point. But also the opposite is true, that um, like the Third Reich definitely was under um, demonic influence. So, but what does that mean? If you're a German citizen, 1938, what does that mean? Do you stop paying your taxes? Um, do you stop obeying whatever civil laws? So that's where it gets, that's where it gets dicey, okay? Um, right, well, yeah, but we're, I, but in terms of this, where the rubber hits the road and what we owe our government. Um, all right, so we'll, we'll flesh this out a little bit more here. Um, okay, this next one I think will help us here. So 465, when is a citizen forbidden to obey uh, civil authorities? A citizen is obliged in conscience not to obey laws of civil authorities when they are contrary to the demands of the moral order. And a quote from, I believe it's Peter, uh, we must obey God rather than men. Uh, in, from Acts of the Apostles. Um, so this is why I put this up here. If you have a civil law that is contradiction to either divinely revealed law or the natural law, it's not legitimate. So uh, China used to have a one-child policy. Um, they dropped the one-child policy uh, not too long ago because they see the demographic winter that will soon plague the entire planet. That uh, world population will probably peak at 9 billion and then there will be a precipitous decline. And so the Chinese see it and they reverse it. That's another issue. Um, but forced abortions, for instance, that's not a legitimate authority. That's not a legitimate law, okay? Um, or let's say you're whatever county clerk. Who was that woman in Kentucky who refused to sign the wedding license of two people of the same sex? I, I forget her name, but she was you know in the news for a couple of days or whatever. Um, you know, uh, in my mind, it's not. A legitimate it's not a, these are not real marriages Just any more than you know you go to a, a different country and maybe they believe in polygamy and and marrying eight-year-olds um, so what, what do you do as a civil official in these things like when do we when do we say that no um, we're not, we're not going to treat so or uh, Jim Crow laws, maybe, for instance. Maybe that's another example. Um, point is, there are certain civil laws that they're in contradiction to our faith. And we're not talking about meat on Fridays. We're talking about the moral law. Um, then they're not legitimate laws. and We don't have to obey them. Okay, But uh, what side of the road you drive on, you better believe you have to obey that. Okay, And it's a violation of the Fourth Commandment it, because you were inspired by the uh, Queen Elizabeth's funeral, you want to start driving on the left side of the road. <laughs> it's a violation of Fourth Commandment. Okay. Now, what about um, what about other vehicular uh, laws like uh, the speed limit? And what about what's commonly accepted? Okay. So, is it a sin against the Fourth Commandment to go 36 miles an hour in a 35 mile an hour zone, or on the interstate when if it's 65, you're going 66 miles an hour? Uh, is that material for confession? Meanwhile, people are zipping past you. <laughs> um, because the common, I mean, I don't know, what would you guys say is the common 
uh, held, uh, what would you call that? I mean, what do you, where do you, where do you think the real line is when it comes to the speed limit? Let's say the post uh, the, the signage is sixty five miles an hour. Seventy. Sixty nine. Sixty nine. Okay. So we don't yeah, we don't have an exact line here, but I think it's commonly held that to go one or two miles over the speed limit is not um, is not opposed to the the law and a cop. Unless he's having a really, really bad day, maybe. He ain't going to pull you over for going one over. You'll probably get yelled at. <laughs> but, so, I mean, that's another aspect about law. This is how these things can start to get complicated pretty quickly, right? Because you have common experience. Because one aspect of law, not only is an ordinance of reason, it's got to be promulgated by a proper authority, okay? So, like, um, when you're a child, your neighbors... They had no right to tell you what time to go to bed, okay? They're not the, the appropriate authority. They're not the legitimate authority. Your parents, or oh. maybe the babysitter that your parents oh. hired, that's the legitimate authority. They tell you when you go to bed, not the neighbor, okay? But also, uh, it's got to be promulgated. It's got to be known, okay? So you can't change the signage out there on 64 and, um, and not tell anybody. That would not be legitimate, but also it has to be accepted. The law has to be accepted. Uh, and so on the issue of the, the speed limit, it seems as though what the populace has accepted is that it's okay to go several miles over the speed limit, but probably not 15 miles over, okay? So it is a little bit complicated, ain't it? Okay. Yeah. What about, is it a sin not Try not to pay tax when your government's paying for abortion. Mm. Okay. No, that's a that's a good question because all right, um, our government has a rather large budget, um, and a percentage of that goes to bad things. What is our responsibility? We all just stop paying taxes. Well, there are a lot of those new IRS uh, people who are now, I think, armed and ready to take lethal force. Uh, so. Um, yeah, I don't think any Catholic moral theologian would say, all right, because point whatever percentage of the budget of the federal government will go to abortions or gender reassignment surgery Stop for, that. we don't take, everything. never mind, um, or whatever the case may be, um, do we just stop paying our taxes? I don't think anybody would advocate for that. Um, I think it's our responsibility to, to try to um, get our government to go away from all that stuff. But there is, there's another principle of how proximate are you to supporting an evil? By paying your taxes, uh, are you and I are, are, are we procuring an abortion? It's so remote that we are not guilty of that, okay? But um, there are things that are much more proximate. Shouldn't vote for anybody that... But, and that would be a much more proximate thing, Okay. So you get two candidates, and one's clearly uh, in agreement with divinely revealed law and with natural law, and the other one's like, no, kill everything. Um, you got to go with the one uh, who is uh, supporting life. That's much more proximate. And I do believe we'll be held accountable on how we vote, okay? Um, and hierarchy of values. What your tax, how much you're being taxed, that's one thing. Whether or not this person is for abortion all nine months, plus some, um, hierarchy, the, the life has to be more important than how much you're paying in taxes. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, all right. So that's that. All right. Anything else real quick? Because I do want to get through, at least introduce the next commandment. We're not going to get through it. Because it, it's getting thick. You know, this kills me too. But why, before elections, can't the priest say, when you go to the polls, vote as Christ would vote? I do. You yell at me? Well, I'm not here when you put it. <laughs> well, <laughs> well. You get them all to do that. I even sense. give voting guides, okay? Well, With know. names. I do. <laughs> um, okay. I knew you did. But this is what's called scandal. 
And you see that uh, you see that even within the hierarchy, some are doing their job, others not doing their job in the hierarchy. All right. So, um, thou shalt not kill is our next commandment. And uh, okay. So again, another lighthearted issue. Um, so why? All right. Why must human life be respected? Because it's sacred. Because it's in the image and likeness of God. That is, it's in possession of a rational soul that's endowed with an intellect and a will. Every single one of us, even even uh, Down syndrome folks, even or even even less capacity than that. Um, murderers and murderers and evil people and and the whole gamut. Um, this is at any rate. So it's sacred, and this is what our equality rests upon. Okay. Um, which, you know, the atheists have a very hard time. Why even bother? Why is anything sacred? They have a very hard time with that one. All right. Uh, why is uh, the legitimate defense of persons and of society not opposed to this norm? So what do we mean by that? We're basically talking about there are certain times. So we shouldn't kill people. That's the commandment. But there are certain exceptions, aren't there? When somebody's breaking into your home, wielding a gun, okay? Or when the neighboring country invades your country, um, and we'll talk about just war a little bit more later, but there is, there can be a just war. Just leave it at that. And so, you know, killing is involved. But is that a violation when the burglar, or perhaps attempted, you know, when Ted Bundy, uh, crawls through your window and you know he's been on the prowl, um, is it a sin to put a bullet in him? No. Okay. But why? This is getting a little heady, but it is important. The principle of double effect. In other words, there's some things that we do that have two effects. Ted Bundy's coming through your window and you put a bullet in him, uh, there are, what are the two effects? All right, one effect is that you've just killed Ted Bundy, okay? The other effect is that you preserved your family and your teenage daughter, okay? So you killed Ted Bundy and you defended your, your family. Now, what, <laughs> what it's like, else? Um, what? What if somebody's just coming through your window? Well, where's the whole, wait, wait a second. Let's keep it simple. Keep it simple here. But, um, so there, there are two effects here. Are, is it really your intention to kill a human being? Or is it your intention to preserve your family? Your, your, your intention, what you're wanting to do, what you're doing is preserving your family. It has the second effect of killing Ted Bundy. Uh, but you are preserving your family, okay? And so this will come into uh, uh, the, the, the same issue of um, when we're talking about abortions, you're talking about the life of the mother, uh, something analogous. Uh, the most common uh, pregnancy that can threaten the life of a mother is an ectopic uh, pregnancy, okay? When the conceived child that's conceived in the fallopian tube decides to attach not in the uterine wall where the child is supposed to, but rather in fallopian tube, all right? So if you have, um, what, so what can you do? So if you, if you leave, um, if the child, if the child uh, attaches so, to the fallopian tube, it will begin to grow. And if you don't do anything about it, both child and mother will die, okay? So some will say, well, you should just have an abortion. Okay. Um, no, what you do with the idea of principle of double effect is that you excise that portion of the fallopian tube, okay? And extract that part, portion of the fallopian tube. That child will die naturally, okay? Um, and so that's not your intention, though. 
It's not a direct killing. Your intention is to preserve uh, the life of the mother, etc. So those are, those are a couple of examples when it comes to principle double effect. So um, on the issue of just war and being able to be a soldier, go into battle and to fire down range, um, that's not a sin. Okay. Now, let's say you are demented uh, and you really just want to kill people, actually. And you figure, well, the only place you can do that and not go to jail is to join the military. <laughs> that would be, so that's where intention is important as well. Um, I'm not saying that there are any like that, but I'm just saying that as an example. So their intention is just to kill somebody. And the secondary effect is, I guess, serving the country. All right. So um, self-defense, uh, whether it's a family or country, that is legitimate even with lethal force, okay. Now, uh, what's the purpose of punishment? Punishment imposed by a legitimate public authority has the aim of redressing the disorder introduced by the offense or defending uh, public order or people's safety and contributing to the correction of the guilty party. Okay. Um, now, what kind of punishment can be imposed? Basically, the I'm going to talk about the death penalty here. So uh, what I can say is that historically, um, for, I mean, since the beginning, the church has always taught that the state preserves the right to capital punishment. The state has uh, the authority to impose capital punishment. Now, how that is done is a separate issue. If a seven-year-old steals a candy bar at the gas station, not legitimate re reason, okay? Uh, so that, that's a very simple case. Um, even like uh, St. Thomas More, who was a lawyer, who was the uh, right-hand man of Henry VIII, um, until he wouldn't go along uh, with Henry's uh, unjust laws, ends up getting jailed, and ultimately beheaded, he paid his executioner uh, as he's uh, heading up to, to, to be executed. And I think he said, you know, do your, do your duty well, okay? So there you have a saint uh, about to be executed. He's not like protesting, like this is against what Christ, whatever. Um, the state has the right to capital punishment. Now, I'd say that that was not the right thing to do, uh, to kill Thomas More, but but here's the issue. Um, Pope John Paul II uh, kind of stirred things up in this regard. And he started giving language uh, that came pretty much up to the point of saying, it didn't go past the line, but it came kind of close to the line of saying that uh, capital punishment is never legitimate. He comes close to that, okay? And so in Evangelium Vitae, which was, I believe, an uh, early 90s encyclical by him, um, he said that capital punishment, quote, uh, or how is it phrased, quote, are very rare, if not practically non-existent. But what's very rare? It's the um, necessity. Uh, he's arguing that the necessity of capital punishment is very rare, if practically non-existent. And that... Um, when non-lethal means are sufficient, authority should limit itself to such means because they better correspond to the uh, concrete conditions of the common good, dignity of human person, possibility of reforming himself, etc. So um, there's a little bit, and Francis has even gone further, okay? Um, he's... Uh, he gave the instruction that the catechism needs to be changed on capital punishment to say that uh, non posse admiti est. It's not, it cannot be admitted, which sounds like it is an intrinsic evil, which would be a complete contradiction from what the church has taught for 2,000 years. But such is the lack of clarity that we are currently experiencing from the Vatican right now. That's another issue. We're not going down that rabbit hole, friends. But my point is, what I can say about this is uh, the church historically and still technically today says that the, the state has the right um, to inflict capital punishment, okay? But just know that John Paul II 
said that's got to be extremely rare. Um, now, what is the weight of that teaching as opposed to previous popes? That's more for theology on tap, okay? That'd, that'd be for a different class who was kind of thinking about things. Whereas I'm just trying to give you the, the, the fundamentals. All right, and just a little bit more. Man, this is going to be tough. Okay, uh, what's forbidden by the fifth commandment? Any direct or intentional murder or cooperation in it. You can't hire a hitman. Okay, you better confess it if you did. All right, direct abortion, uh, willed as an end or as a means. Okay, what do, we, what do we mean by that? So you're just terminating pregnancy to some people, just that's, that's, that's the purpose. Or means, maybe their intention, they don't want to kill the child, they just want to continue their graduate studies or something. And so in order to be able to do that in their mind successfully, they're going to have to get this abortion, which is therefore then the means, whatever. But a direct abortion, um, and that's why the, ecto the ectopic pregnancy, that's why you don't directly kill the, the child. The child is innocent, but you allow the child to die a natural death because it, it, the child's going to die anyways. Um, so, uh, well, there used to be a penalty of excommunication attached to it. There's certain things, there's certain sins that have automatic excommunication uh, attached to it. Um, I believe, uh, did Francis lift that? Or did he just give blanket faculty to every priest to be able to lift it? So let's just say another example would be the attempted assassination of uh, the Pope. If somebody were to go to confession, confess that, um, I wouldn't be able to absolve them because that is a sin reserved to the Holy See because it's so grave, okay? And, uh, and so there, there's a whole process involved in that. We don't have time to, to get into that. But at any rate, that, that should be enough. But um, that's that. Uh, direct euthanasia, which consists in putting an end to the life of the handicapped, the sick, or those near death, by an act or by the omission of a required action, okay? So any direct killing, mercy killing, okay? People die naturally. We, we pray for from conception, to respect life from conception until natural death, okay? Any direct killing of a person for whatever reason is wrong, period. Now, what are the issue of pain medication? Well, Pisotrol taught in the 50s that pain medication is legitimate. Even if pain medication does happen to slightly shorten your life, it can still be legitimate. But you could probably use pain medication as a, as a lethal force. If you give somebody too much um, morphine, it's, it's going to kill them, okay? And so we just you know, where that balance is exactly, again, and here's another thing, um, when it comes to these types of issues, we're going to talk about end-of-life issues here in a second, sometimes it can be very complicated, okay, and it's case by case, there are different circumstances, and so, at any rate, but we're just speaking in generalities right now, um, you can't use pain medications to kill somebody, you can use it to alleviate their pain, and if it happens to hasten their death, then it happens to hasten their death. Um, but you can't be directly killing people. Um, what else? All right, so, so suicide and voluntary cooperation in it, insofar as it is a grave offense against the just love of God or self or of neighbor. One's responsibility may be aggravated by the scandal given. One who is psychologically disturbed or is experiencing grave fear, we have diminished responsibility, right? So what's the church saying here? Uh, it is a sin to commit suicide. That's a serious sin because God gave you life, okay? Now, some people are uh, mentally disturbed. And so what is their guilt there? The church is saying, well, there is diminished responsibility. God will sort it out. He is the judge, okay? And I know suicide, it, it, it touches a lot of families. It's a very sad thing. Um, but what would be an example of, you know, just saying, no, that's not cool. Um, 
I don't know, maybe early May 1945, and the Soviets are encircling Berlin, and the Nazi hierarchy is like, all right, I can either get arrested um, or do the noble thing and take my life. Or while they still had the ability to escape Berlin, um, uh, no, I'd rather just commit suicide because my Third Reich failed. Okay? That's not legitimate at all. And I don't think you can argue psychological diminishment um, or whatever. Okay? There's some cultures that just uh, that sort of promote that, as it were. Weren't, weren't this the, the samurai? Weren't they big on uh, suicide? Yeah. yeah. You can't do that. For honor. For honor. Yeah, so that's not a case where diminish, where with a psychological uh, disturb, um, uh, disturbation or grave fear. That was an issue of, you know, of honor. All right. Now, all right, this is, we got to be self, uh, we got to have some discipline here because this one's hard and this will be our last one. Uh, what medical, uh, what medical procedures are permitted when death is considered imminent? When death is considered imminent, the ordinary care owed to a sick person cannot be legitimately interrupted. So there's an issue of what's called ordinary care. If somebody's able to digest food and to drink water, you owe them food and water. Okay. That is ordinary care. Uh, very famous case on that is Terry Schiavo, circa 2005, if you remember that. Oh, yeah. And uh, they starved her to death. That was a very, very clear violation of ordinary care. Um, somebody who was in a quote-unquote vegetative state. And uh, at any rate, was denied food and drink until she um, starved to death. Um... However, it is legitimate to use painkillers, I mentioned that, which do not aim at death, and to refuse overzealous treatment. So they're saying uh, that uh, that is the utilization of disproportionate medical procedures without reasonable hope of a positive outcome. All right, so uh, this will be really what we'll end on here. Um, end of life decisions, they can be very they're just difficult. I mean, somebody, usually a loved one, is dying, and what's the right thing to do? Um, the doctors are giving you some options of procedures. <clears throat> Let's make an easy case. You have somebody who's 102 years old, and um, you know they're starting to fail. Uh, there could be, they're not rich. Uh, in fact, probably low middle income uh, type earner. Uh, there are a couple of options surgically that would drain the family's uh, savings. Um, very little prospect for be able to uh, cut, return to health. Um, and you're 102 years old. Uh, so that's a pretty clear case where you don't need to undergo whatever procedure um, because there's not a good, there's not a high prospect of returning to health. Uh, you are depleting your family's resources, uh, which ought to be a secondary thing, monetary, but uh, what if you're living in the third world and that money actually does mean a lot to you and there's not a you know, social safety net or whatever, then that's different in third world. What's ordinary care in the United States may be different in sub-Saharan Africa. There are a lot of factors, people. What I can tell you is that if, um, if you have any doubt or unsure what to do, uh, you, can, you can call me and if I know the answer, fine. But sometimes they're difficult cases, and I have to call a bioethicist and, uh, and give them the facts of the case and ask, what is the best path forward in this? So I have a priest who has a doctorate in moral theology. He is my medical power of attorney, and uh, so I trust he'll do the right thing uh, should I become incapacitated, Okay. All right, any last second things here? Because we are long today, yeah. What if a person was on their deathbed and they knew they were dying and they were down to the last week or so and that person decides, I'm not going to take any war and I'm not going to take any food and instructs his medical people to that effect? That'd be ordinary care. Uh, so to starve yourself, in other words? Yeah. I'd say that's, that's illegitimate, yeah. I don't, 
even if he requests it. I think people who are dying are not hungry. They don't want to eat. Uh, well, yeah, and if they're not hungry, then they're not hungry. Yeah. But if, if they're like, you know, I'm just going to stop because I just want to <coughs> die, I mean, that's obviously a... Not kosher. A, 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 a doctor wouldn't operate on you at one point. Right. I think, I think when people are dying, mm -hmm. they don't really want to eat or drink. Mm -hmm. People I've seen dying do not. Mm -hmm. And I think it's up to the right. patient and the yeah. family if they take medication. Why give somebody who's dying Crestor, you know, or some of these <laughs> other true. medications that they don't really, that's maybe something for pain, mm -hmm. but I, I, I don't know, maybe that's, not, maybe that's against the church, but so that's what I believe. the point is, well, we can't be... <laughs> Folks, we do have to believe what the church teaches, but I, what I am saying is that these can get very complicated yes. very quickly yeah. okay it but it doesn't but but that doesn't that doesn't give us license to to be able to to do really anything but ordinary care that's the principle ordinary care um okay all right glory be to the father and to the son and to the holy spirit as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end amen the lord be with you through the intercession of Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, with the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, sin upon you and reign with you forever. Amen. 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 Thanks, y'all.